Yeah. So, okay. Um, quickly sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you everyone for uh, joining this session on linked data event streams and more specifically what I think is ought to be the base API for uh, open data sets. And this is really the base question that I've been asking together with my research team for the past, I'm a, I, I think already eight years. And it's what's the best API to publish an open data set. And I'm not the only one who tried to find out uh, uh, an, an answer or to find a question, to find an answer to that question. For example, you have the, the geospatial uh, people that started uh, with, with uh, the WFS specification, the web feature service that is a geospatial web querying API. You have the linked data people that, that started the Sparkle endpoints and, and, uh, and, and a query language that, that can query over, over uh, uh, graph data. And you have many, many, many other uh, specific APIs that you can host over your uh, data set. But then, of course, from all these great querying APIs, which one do you host? Well, if you look, for example, at, at, at Flanders, uh, then, then there's a, you have the address database. They, have, they already have quite a couple of, of APIs uh, online, like the, um, um, they, they about have, have 17 on, the, on their website, and you can have a tool, a wizard, to, to help you pick the right API uh, that, that you should start using to, to do something with the address registry. But um, uh, if you want to look for a simple auto-completion functionality, that's not included in the in the in the set of APIs. So, um, so so that that wouldn't work. And right now, if you if you ask them how much this costs to keep online these seventeen different very specific APIs, they would answer that costs a lot. Even to maintain all these specific APIs, that costs a lot. And so this this situation where where on top of a data set you keep creating more and more uh, APIs that you that you keep try to keep uh, uh, that you try to keep up with uh, with the recent trends. Um, that is uh, 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 that is what I call a maintenance hell because you will uh, just keep on creating legacy APIs that need to be uh, maintained. A second fallback or like the fallback approach to, to that is uh, we will share a data dump. And then if you're interested, you can just uh, create an auto-completion API yourself on top of that data set and everyone is happy. Although with the address registry, what we noticed is that, for example, um, local governments started to create local changes to their own copy of the uh, of the data set, and they didn't go back to the to the to the master data set. So, in that sense, we started creating out of date, hard to synchronize copies of the of, of the data sets that that are uh, maintained everywhere by everyone and by nobody at the same time. Uh, and this is what I call the replication hell. The I think these are these are two really big problems that that we see when when we try to 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 design the the, the best API possible for for an open data set and neither of these two solutions is uh, is is, uh, is is good because they they both have uh, have have problems so how do you define what your priorities should be um, uh, when trying to publish a new data set well, this is uh, then the idea that that we positioned is that you should do as uh, as as uh, the, the the least amount of effort as as possible, and the least amount of effort as possible is when you keep working with the, with, the, with when you try to to get everyone to set up their own uh, querying API. But of course, you need to be able to uh, make sure that everyone can sync with the latest change on, on top of your master data so that you really claim and, and advertise to everyone, I'm the master source of this data. And if there are updates in the, in the uh, happening in the real world, you should just come and fetch them from my event stream. And this is, uh, uh, this is I think, the, 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 new, uh, the new next thing that, that we need to convince everyone about is to make sure that we do lifecycle management across our objects, uh, that we do lifecycle management for our, uh, for our data sets. Because that's in, the, in this way, we're going to make sure that this completion API is always going to be able to work on the la last version, this geospatial interface as well, this linked data interface as well, and so on and so forth. But 
there's no specification yet for a stream of linked data objects. And uh, you may say, well, there's, uh, there's of course, news feeds like, uh, like JSON feed or like Atom RSS and so on. But I like the ideas behind the, behind these specifications, but there are no linked data specifications. They don't allow any uh, uh, linked data sets to, to, be, uh, to, to publish their latest uh, objects uh, towards the outside world. So uh, we designed one over the last, uh, last two years. We, we've been designing this, this interface. It's called the linked data event stream specification. And we define a linked data event stream as an always growing collection of never changing objects. So never changing objects. These are objects that we that that live that that live in a specific moment in time. For example, an air quality observation that uh, an observation that once was made and you will never change that anymore in the in the future because that was the truth that that's uh, at that point. Um, you could also see it as a version objects, like a version of a specific uh, uh, street name or a version of a specific address, uh, and and we'll make sure to, uh, uh, to to make that object. And if you want to go back in time, you will be able to find that object uh, uh, as it were uh, at at that uh, timestamp. So for uh, uh, for this interface, we designed one with the simplicity of Atom and RSS uh, also in mind. And uh, uh, one page of, of such event stream contains a data description, just like RSS. It contains uh, uh, links to other pages. And it contains, of course, all the items uh, in that page. Uh, so, uh, so you can navigate through the, through the event stream by just uh, uh, going, uh, following uh, links through the, uh, through the thing. If, you want, if you're a technical person and you want to go dive deeper in this uh, specification, you can find it at w3id.org. Uh, slash LDES slash specification. Uh, we are proud to uh, announce that this is getting adopted by the CEMEC program at, uh, at the European Commission. Uh, so this will really become a European uh, specification for, uh, uh, for uh, publishing linked data. So with linked data event streams, you can just replicate the data and that's interesting, but you cannot query the data then uh, you can you can only copy all the data and if you would have a question like uh, um, uh, give me uh, all the air quality observations over the past 10 year you will just have to download all that uh, all that all that data you will not be able to immediately put in uh, uh, put in uh, uh, well, give me an overview of the of the of the yearly summaries, for example, of that uh, of that time series, or uh, give me all the exceptional uh, results over over that uh, period of time. That's also something that's not possible. You actually need to download it, and you need all to do all the processing on uh, your own machines. That's also interesting. Why? Because the right effort is hap or the the right investments uh, are in a ha are happening at the right place. For example, uh, if uh, I uh, am interested in a very specific uh, uh, processing of a specific data set, then it's me who will have to invest in that uh, in, in that uh, in that processing, and I don't think that should be the data publisher that should invest in my specific use of that uh, uh, of, of that data set. But I do think that we will be able to um, to grow towards a more efficient uh, ecosystem where we all work together towards uh, a, a more a better and, and a more efficient uh, uh, data ecosystem where we share efforts of indexing uh, data sets and this indexation. This is what I think can happen with uh, fragmentations. Let's look at uh, uh, linked data event streams. How do we go then in the end towards a specific geospatial uh, interface. I think that you can uh, uh, first just geospatially fragment that uh, that linked data event stream. You can create tiles from that uh, uh, from that event stream so that every geospatial tile also has an event stream in itself. And if then, for example, you need to calculate the route from A to B, then you can just download the right fragments of that uh, event stream just in time. The data will be uh, will be less big to download. It will still be a considerable amount amount of data to download, but you will be able to download it just in time to answer your uh, query as well. And this downloading just in time, well, this is also interesting because that means that you can also do that on a server. And if you do it on a server, then you can also expose again this querying interface. So I see I see a three-level uh, architecture that uh, that that uh, for for um, for open data APIs uh, in the future that looks like this. 
at the core, I see the linked data event stream. It's the it's the thing that if you don't do the linked data event stream, then you're not hosting uh, a, a proper open data set. I believe if you don't host the, the base open data event stream API, then you're just cutting corners and you're not giving your end users the, the, the flexibility they need on top of your data. But on top of that linked data event stream, what you should do, what you must do, in fact, you can do optionally, you can build uh, some reusable indexes yourself. And this is the second tier. You can fragment your linked data event stream by geospatial uh, areas, or you can fragment it by um, by prefix, saying that everything with the letter A will be found in uh, in that uh, in, in that part. Um, you can also fragment it by time period. You could say, well, I'm going to, to first have uh, um, uh, all my data from this year is, is in that fragment, while all the uh, others are in, are in the other. And you can have many, many other different uh, fragmentations that you can uh, think of. These are indexes that can be created by you and yourself to stimulate the ecosystem of to reuse your data set, but it can be equally uh, created by uh, third parties. We will see in the in the, the the next presentation. We will see some interesting use cases where third parties may actually have uh, good incentives to uh, to do exactly that. Then, uh, uh, on top of these uh, reusable indexes, only then I think that we will see querying interfaces for which you can, if you really want to do developer enablement as a, as a data owner, you can, for example, host a Spark endpoint, you can host a WFS service, a GraphQL uh, interface, a Cypher interface, whatever. Uh, but I do think that these things are um, uh, are less stable if you if you do it as as a, as a as a data uh, data uh, provider yourself. Um, why? Because well, they should always be uh, last priority to keep online. So if they go offline, I think people should always be able to fall back towards the reusable indexes, and even if these go offline, that they're able to fall back to the linked data event stream at the core. Good. So this ecosystem then looks something like this. We will have multiple uh, fragmentations, which you can see as uh, tree structures on top of the event stream. And then, the, for example, the geospatial APIs, these are going to download the right uh, fragments of the data when a specific question comes in. But the specific APIs will uh, mostly be uh, hosted by the third parties themselves. We've all, for these fragmentations, we've also built the tree specification. The tree specification is, uh, or the linked data event stream specification is built upon the tree specification. Uh, but they, uh, the tree specification allows you to um, uh, to fragment a collection of uh, objects, and uh, you can specify uh, different relations on top of your uh, fragmentations. Like you can have relations uh, concerning geospatial relations, suffix relations, substring relations, time time based uh, relations, and so on and so forth. That's it. Uh, if this sounded uh, somewhat interesting, know that uh, my team is hiring. So uh, this is my current team. Uh, uh, I'm looking for more people. So uh, feel free to send me an email if you're interested in doing something uh, something with, uh, with the linked data event streams. That's going to be the vision for the next uh, four years of research. Um, and uh, that's it. This was a very general and, and very abstract and very difficult uh, introduction on linked data event streams and tree, tree and everything that we're doing uh, in that realm. But I want to make it more concrete. And that's why I'm from, from this moment on, I'm going to uh, keep my mouth uh, shut. And I have um, invited way more interesting people than, than uh, myself. I have invited people that actually do things in the real world. Um, so uh, yeah, without spoiling anything uh, of their presentations, I'm just going to give the floor to Erwin. OK, thank you, Peter. Uh, also, thank you for the invitation. But it sounds a little bit that we are doing stuff in the real world and that you are doing nothing real important. But <laughs> I would say more the opposite. But anyway, um, let's see how I can get this working. Uh, share my screen. Um, um, okay. Are you yeah. now seeing my screen? Not yet, but I suppose Not it's coming. Yet. Oh, well, uh, sorry, I have to push another button. It's working now? We don't see it yet. Nope. No. Okay. 
for um for everyone uh, in in the in the meantime yes now it's coming Aaron now we oh, see something moving uh, and it stopped and Erwin is gone okay um, we'll oh, wait a moment it's crashing oh no you're uh, you're still your sound is still here Erwin yeah Chrome is crashing okay I know he's gone uh, okay just uh, uh, just to um, uh, <laughs> uh for for the for the audience um there will be room after all the talks to ask questions uh, we we've uh, we've foreseen quite some time for for questions to specific speakers so please write them down on a piece of paper or write them down in the chat uh we'll get back to them uh after uh after all the talks um yeah and we'll 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 try to uh, moderate that discussion then hi Aaron, you're back yeah, a Chrome crashed. <laughs> yeah, we know uh, about technical problems, but uh, now let's see if I can. Uh, I will try to share my full screen right now. See if that's improving. So it seems that it takes some while. Do you see my screen now? Yes, now it works. Okay. Floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks, and sorry for all the technical problems. Um, yeah, so uh, Peter asked us to tell us a little bit about what we are doing in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, together with, with Wouter, uh, uh, we're going to, to talk a little bit about what we uh, what we did so far, what our plans are, and uh, and Wouter will actually show uh, a demo of uh, linked data event streams uh, proof of concept that we are currently working on. Um, so, uh, well, uh, my name is Arvind Volmer. I work at the Dutch Kadaster and also at the University of Twente. Um, and in the uh, Dutch Kadaster, um, uh, I'm leading the data science team, and we are trying to to bring linked data and knowledge graphs a step further in our in our team. So, at Kadaster, we have quite a long-standing history of uh, of dealing with uh, with linked data. Uh, I think. The, the first data set, the key register, Anderson Buildings, I think we published already for more than five years as what we call a production linked data. So it's really as a production effort, it's available and you can use it. Um, and we also have this approach used for uh, many other uh, data sets around. However, uh, we found out that, that maybe last year that, well, uh, we had a lot of uh, kind of problems in this 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 flow of dealing with linked data especially we had a lot of data sets standing in the queue to be published by by us as linked data but uh, the team was not really capable of handling all the data sets because it simply took quite a while to publish the, uh, a data set as linked data we took more several months to to publish this kind of key registers so we thought, and also the te technology was much more uh, further developed at that time when we started five years ago, we had to develop uh, much of our own tools. Um, uh, but now a lot of improvements have been made in the, in the linked data uh, uh, tooling, uh, at least. So last year we set up a new approach. Uh, can we make linked data more easily, more cost effective, uh, uh, so that it doesn't have to take months to publish a, a key register of linked data, but can we do it within maybe five or uh, 10 weeks, but uh, it's much faster and, uh, and much simpler in, uh, in tools. And uh, well, we kind of succeeded. So now we, we published uh, the new key registers uh, with this new approach. And uh, uh, in, in January or February, we released the Bach 2.0, so the key register uh, Anderson building again, but now a new version. And now it takes us only five, uh, five weeks to publish these kinds of uh, large key registers. So, and also the, the key register topography, uh, large scale topography is now also published through this new linked data, what you call registration architecture. So you see the, the links over here. So how does this, uh, I won't go into details in this 10 minutes, but uh, uh, basically we, we get the data from a Postgres database and then we have some very simple uh, uh, tooling, software components like the enhancer and the, and the microservice and they, they will load in the end the, the triples into the, the triple DB triple store and then we put uh, different views, APIs uh, on top of it. Uh, 
most relevant for our, our uh, uh, new approach is that we actually kind of divided the, the, the linked data into two parts. So we have what we call the registration view. This, this is the lower part. Uh, sorry for the Dutch, uh, by the way, in this, this slide, uh, where we just publish a data set as is, as linked data, as where the data model looks as much as possible to the original data model of the uh, not linked data set. Um, and then uh, on top of it, we put the knowledge graph where we do get a kind of object view on the data, where we integrate the data from the different uh, data sets below. But we also get a more customer friendly view on this data. And, uh, and in line with the previous uh, picture, then on top of this knowledge graph, we put all kinds of APIs uh, on top of it for the different kind of, uh, of users that we have. So this is now working uh, quite okay. So why then are we now moving on and also participating in uh, this uh, linked data event streams, a proof of concept? Well, um, uh, we believe that it might be one of the, the APIs that we put on top of this knowledge graph uh, infrastructure and also on, on the data set. Um, we have to find out, of course, it's just the first steps, but basically already it's, it, 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 um, it also fits with the, with the ideas that we have that linked data should be much more cost effective and much more simplified uh, in a way. So there we have already uh, a good connection, uh, I, I think. Um, but, but what we also have to find out, okay, so then it, it might fit, it might fit in the technical architecture, but for what kind of use cases uh, um, does it really make sense to, the, to use this approach? Um, so we have to find, find this out. And uh, finally, we also find it very interesting. Uh, I think we can work much more together as, as Belgium and the Netherlands uh, to learn from each other. We are dealing with the same kind of data, the same kind of uh, stuff. So, uh, uh, so we also see it as a very nice start of a collaboration between uh, Flandre, uh, Belgium, and the, and the Netherlands uh, on this topic. So, um, but what did we do already then on this linked data event streams? And so that's the point in time where I would like to hand over to uh, to Wouter. Wouter, can you show us what we did so far? Yeah, thanks, uh, Erwin. And uh, let me see, I'm going to share my screen. If it's okay, you can now see uh, the triple store uh, at, uh, at Cadaster. Uh, specifically, you can see uh, the two data sets that we currently uh, um, expose through the link data event streams. Uh, so that is the, the uh, key registry large scale topography uh, BGT on the left hand side. You can also see that these are fairly large data sets. So this is uh, the BGT uh, large scale topography uh, key registry is uh, over 1.3 billion uh, triples. And we also have the uh, base registry of addresses and buildings or uh, BAG, B-A-G. And that is uh, 850 million uh, and slightly over 850 million triples. So these are relatively large uh, linked data sets uh, around uh, 1 billion, uh, slightly below, slightly over 1 billion. And uh, of course, we want to expose them now using uh, link data event streams. Uh, we did an implementation of link data event streams, uh, which is currently here running on, on localhost. So this is basically the implementation uh, where I currently configured uh, the BAG, so the base registry of addresses and buildings. And then I can search for different times. So we implemented the, the time index. And I can then, uh, when I change the, the date, uh, I also get a different, uh, a different part of the, of the key registry uh, back. So this is, say, the low-level API. I can also, because it's JSON-LD, I can also easily put it in our uh, triple store. And then in the context of our triple store, it becomes a little bit easier to process. Of course, what I just showed you was really the raw uh, JSON endpoint. Um, then you can also see a little bit of the structure, like how uh, the data is uh, fragmented into different uh, different nodes that are part of the same bigger collection. And specifically for our uh, key registry, uh, this is uh, one of the nodes that uh, you can then uh, uh, retrieve. Uh, the nodes have relationships to other nodes, uh, and those relations are semantically qualified. So you can go for a less than or equal to relation but you can also go for a uh, larger, a greater than or equal to relation. And so the pagination is basically semantically meaningful, which is one of the key innovations, I think, of, uh, of linked data event streams. And you can also take a look at uh, the incoming node. 
So the incoming node is then uh, the, the key registry collection, uh, which gives you, in this case, 10 members. And so those are uh, verblijfs of objecten, uh, places of residency in the Netherlands. And these are, this is actually the content uh, that is uh, part of the, of the key registry. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are looking at something with a uh, one funksy. So this is a place of, uh, of residency, not like a store or, uh, or not an office space, right? Uh, so this is really great. It's now running on, uh, on localhost, as I already mentioned. It took us only one sprint uh, to implement, and our sprints uh, in, uh, in the Cadastro Data Science team are three weeks. So in three weeks, we were able to, uh, to implement it comfortably. Uh, also uh, uh, able to give some feedback on the on the link data event stream specification. So I would say it's a very good specification and it's very easy to implement. In the next sprint, so the next three weeks, uh, we will uh, make this part of our standard way of exposing the key registries. Uh, this means that in three weeks from now, it will no longer run from uh, localhost. It will actually run from uh, the online triple store and it will be one of the uh, ways in which our key registries will be disclosed. Now, one final point that I want to make here is that if you expose things over this amount of triples, you don't need to use any memory. You can actually use very low level uh, means to expose the data. So it's also a very cost effective way to publish such very large uh, key registries. Uh, that's the demonstration of what we did, how easy it was. And I would actually say everybody should do this. This is a great way to expose your data as linked data. Erwin, did you have some closing words? I, otherwise, I'll give it back to Peter. No, I have no closing words. So uh, this is it. This, uh, yeah, this, this uh, makes me very happy. This is a this is a first. Uh, uh, or one of the the first uh, of, of a few uh, uh, first implementations of the linked data event stream specification. I'm very happy to see that it's uh, that it's easy to implement for for data publishers, even if uh, uh, even if it's the first time looking at the spec. Um, so uh, so yeah, when when do you think that that the audience here will be able to to download the entire BGT? And uh, the entire BAG, so all the addresses in in, in the Netherlands, um, for, uh, as a, as a linked data event stream. Will that be before before the end of the month? Will that be before summer? Can you already make some some guesstimations? Can I answer this, uh, Erwin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, next sprint. So that means uh, the sprint actually starts today. Uh, the, the new sprint. So it means three weeks from now uh, we will have the public endpoints available, uh, which means that you can basically go to the uh, to the data sets that were also communicated in the chat. And then if you go to slash feed, so that will be our new standard uh, path to expose uh, link data event streams. Uh, if the data contains a time dimension, then it will have this slash feed path, uh, like you have slash sparkle or slash GraphQL, you will also have slash feed. And of course, you should be able to walk through all of the data. It scales very well, uh, even for these large key registries of over a billion triples. Yeah, I, I would say April 1st. And if you don't make it, then you can always say it was an April 1st uh, fool's joke. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Then we're always on the safe side. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, but uh, but happy to hear that it uh, uh, that that this means that if I if I add some buffer that certainly before summer uh, there will be an, uh, a new uh, uh, new HTTP point where you will be able to uh, fetch all the data uh, and and make your own intermediary indexes on top of them. Um, there's a small question by by Redmer uh, uh, on uh, in in the chat uh, whether these uh, ten uh, objects they were. Uh, the only changes at this point of time, or was this just subsetted? And uh, I think this is just indeed uh, uh, a page of. Uh, so if you would follow, then the, uh, if you would uh, go to the next page, you will see uh, more uh, objects uh, uh, that may have changed at that time. Uh, so you always need to uh, download more pages than just uh, the, the the last page. Page, I think. Um, good. So uh, let's move towards the the, the presentation. 
uh, of uh, yeah, because it's a bit weird to kick off with uh, with, uh, with at Open Belgium with with uh, with a great presentation by people from the Netherlands. So let's see, let's uh, show that in Belgium we we don't have to uh, to to be shy and that we can also do great things in in, in Belgium itself. And uh, immediately from from uh, from the most beautiful city in Belgium as well. Uh, so yeah, no, I will probably get some comments in the chat as well. Uh, but uh, 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 one of the most beautiful cities in Gen uh, in in in, uh, in Flanders and Belgium, of course, is Ghent. And uh, Olivier, uh, you're uh, you're doing a great project there, right? Hi, thank you, uh, Peter. First of all, thank you for having me, uh, Peter. And so I'm Olivier van den Slager. Um, I'm social strategist at Design Museum Ghent. I previously worked. Um, at MEMO, and before that, that was still PECT, so the Center for um, for uh, Expertise for Digital and um, Digitalization of uh, Cultural Heritage. Um, and now I'm working on a um, big project called the Collections of uh, Ghent. Um, maybe first of all, I'm not um, a developer. I'm an art historian and curator um, in background, so I'm not the most technical profile uh, in the panel. But nonetheless, I'm going to try to give uh, this presentation for you. Let's try and share my screen. I also have an error. Please elaborate on your error uh, if, if there's something we can help you with. Yes, let's, let's try it if it's the screen. It says permission for access uh, to the screen is not given. Yeah, it's your browser. You should normally uh, be able to, to give access. So if, uh, hi, uh, Boris from Cloud68 here. Olivier, if you can go to the top side of your browser where the URL for the page is, mm -hmm. on the left side of the URL next to the flashing microphone, you mm -hmm. should have an icon with, I guess I can describe it as two squares on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so you're going to want to click on that and it should say on the screen, a uh, pop-up will come up and on the screen share, it might say temporarily blocked. Is that the case? No, I don't see the, the icon. I can put it in the same tab. So what browser do you currently have? A Chrome. Oh. No. Working. Uh, perhaps you can upload it as a PDF, Olivier. Is that a a possibility? Yes. Then you mm -hmm. click on um, the plus actions in the left corner, and then you should get the option to upload a PDF. Or I could sell it to Peter if you want to. Um, can you open your share screen, Peter? Because there's a video in it. Yes, that's uh, that's possible. So uh, where it's... did you send it? I can also do it. Eh? Uh, sec, uh, or send, uh, it to... send it to Brecht as well. Yeah. I already have it. So. Okay, Brecht, can you share it? There we go, Olivier. Floor is yours. Yes. Next slide, please. So I, I yeah, okay. I'm just gonna let the video play. Okay. Is there no sound? Is there no sound? So there if it's be. a YouTube video, you can share it directly, uh, by going to the plus icon and pasting the link of the YouTube video there. But when you screen share. Uh, there is no sound coming from your computer. Okay. Uh, it's directly. Oh, yeah. Right. Share.
Yes, that's that's in brief. The very big project we're working on um, right now. Next slide. Yeah. Yes. What the video isn't saying is we're um, so opening up the shared calendar and we're doing so. Um, it's linked open, very important uh, usable data. Um, connects to an uh, interoperable image and asset um, repository. Um, but we're also making it open, so it's not just creating. So so um, that it's not us just creating cool things. But we also want to make sure anyone um, use it and use it in their own way. Uh, next slide. So, opening up isn't enough. Um, we started the whole project uh, with the basic ID that there are already um, a lot of cultural data sets out there, but they are um, not always connected to each other or they are isolated. And if they're not published uh, already, they remain in these closed silos, all governed by each um, institution on their own, all following their own logics. They are not really interoperable um, from the start. Um, so next slide. Um, so what we want to do at heart, at the core of the project, we want to first of all um, connect um, cultural um, collections uh, from four museums. Uh, so we have uh, Stam um, uh, Industry Museum, Hesona uh, Leen Design Museum. But we also want to add um, an archive to the pool. Uh, that's um, some quite new because uh, they all uh, in themselves um, use a different standard um, to describe their data. So the data is um, also registered in a way, which also makes it hard for them uh, to connect or com communicate unless we um, try to translate it into one standard. But then we want to take it uh, one step further. We also want to allow uh, history to be, to be um, published in that same data set or in the same data stream and so we're looking at how people can crowd harvest or crowdsource and um, their objects uh, how they can also use the same model to do so and so everything um, becomes interoperable and everything can be queried without distinguishing whether it comes from an established collection or from um, a citizen of Ghent we want to also um, create new heritage um, so we're talking about Data event streams, and um, I think the the big idea here is that heritage isn't static. Um, so why should our data be? Um, if you look at people are registering today um, in museums, they do so um, in a static. Method. So if something changes, um, let's say um, where, where a piece is um, in a depot or, or it's on display somewhere or it's in a exhibition space, um, the previous data always lost and it's very hard to retrieve unless you start working with backup. Um, so we, we were thinking about together with what if we would start uh, thinking about cultural heritage or, to, or, or try to approach them as being time series. In, um, what if we would be able to um, not only have one single truth but have a single truth that, that allows um, for a multitude um, exposed change as well. Uh, maybe next slide. So, so we have we, we can publish um, cultural heritage objects and by using um, the caching headers or by making sure they're all time stamped. We can then so uh, go back in time, and that would allow us um, to create new um, applications with them. We could uh, track where this was through the time, but we could also track how a description of an object changes, maybe because there's a creator on working on it, um, but also. Um, I mean, try to do that with um, all value um, that has been used uh, by the, um, the registrar. Next slide, please. But of course, it's not enough to be useful um, for the people or for the professionals already working in cultural heritage institutions. But it would be interesting if we can try and figure out what the cross domain of cultural heritage uh, could um, So we're working. The Oslo Culture Steps, which is a new um, application file um, by uh, Flanders, and it's part of or part of a bigger um, set of standards. Um, and we are using that to describe or to form um, our cultural heritage data too. But we also have to something on top of it, uh, which is called Records in Context uh, Standards, 
because we're also working with archives and Oslo at this point in time does not um, readily allow for um, describing archive. And the third uh, big uh, framework we're working with is um, IIIF, which is the International um, Image Operability um, Framework. Uh, next, next slide. By doing this and by uh, finishing uh, a data stream of text that has both um, text coming from um, a descriptive stand of view, but also making sure that um, all the possible reproductions are um, in there and you can query them at the same time, we want to also instigate and um, reuse. And we're um, starting several um, organs or um, several, let's say, streams funding um, also in the project. One of them is a financial scheme where we can um, to 100,000 euros to subsidize, uh, let's, let's say, have startups to reuse the data and make a new application. But we're also starting a cultural data lab where we want to explore together with um, the cultural heritage professionals and the end users um, what we can do um, with that data, um, which will be in the group. Next slide. So this is uh, the, the technical um, architecture um, we're using. I'm not going to really um, go deep into this, but uh, as you can see, it has two major components. This is coming from Atlip. Atlip um, the CMS, so it's a collect management system where they are um, registering all the data um, context from an object. And then we also have all the images um, that describe the objects with productions. Um, and we are trying to... Um, Put them all in the same data stream, which we will then um, publish uh, via um, a triple store, which for this um, the virtuoso. And from there on, people will using uh, Sparkle queries to query the whole data set of all objects, both originating from the cultural heritage professional as from the um, citizen from Ghent, and um, try and encourage reuse from that. And we will also build an immersive immers um, room that will feed uh, also the data event stream as a kind of demonstrate of the power of um, the technology we're using. Um, so thank you for uh, my presentation. All right, cool, Olivier. So uh, so there's a big project, the Cogent project, that's, uh, that's going to, uh, to publish by summer as well, going to publish uh, a lot of collection so really the raw data the the the, the core data of, of of the musea in ghent five musea i think are, are going to be uh published as open data um there this this open data will be linked data thanks to oslo culture so so oslo is the open standards for linking organizations in flanders which is a data uh, standardization uh, initiative uh, they set the standard for for uh, cultural heritage and um, uh, and it will be used uh, to, uh, to to make sure that that uh, that everyone can again uh, create derived services and create derived uh, indexes on top of this, uh, uh, this these data sets. And also within the Cogent project, which is really a big project with a lot of different partners, we're going to make sure that uh, linked data event streams there make sure that everyone always has the last version of the of the uh, of the data and that they always have all the flexibility they need to do anything that they want with the data and this is really important and i think that's really the driver um behind every linked data event stream so um so thanks a lot uh, olivier for for that presentation uh we're a little bit behind schedule uh, a little bit due to the um, to the technical difficulties uh, that that we had i hope we will be spared from technical difficulties uh for the next presentations um the next uh, speaker is uh, brit lonneville uh, brit are you there Yes, I am. <laughs> Super. Can you try to share your screen and and let's hope that it goes uh, <coughs> more swift than. Uh, okay. Than um. Yeah. Are you looking for the buttons or do you find the buttons? Yes. No, oh, I was going to. It works. <laughs> the floor is yours, Britt. Ta-da, technology. Yes. Um, 
So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brit Lonneville, and I work at the Flanders Marine Institute, uh, also known as VLIS. And I'm part of the data center working on the Marine Regions project. And so today I'm going to present to you the Marine Regions Gazetteer. Uh, let me first introduce you to our wonderful team. So we have Leonard Schepers, which is our team leader, and myself. We are the two geographers of the team. Then you have Salvador and Patricia. Uh, those are the two biologists of the team. And then finally, there's Bart van Hoorne from IT, who is supporting us in every way he can with the IT-related stuff. Now, what is Marine Regions all about? Uh, let me try to explain it to you by using a, a very recognizable case. Um, meet Mora Moro, uh, which is a deep sea fish. And this uh, deep sea fish, you can find it uh, around Archimedes Seamount in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, let's say you went out on a dive and you saw quite a lot of Mora Moro, and you want to talk uh, about this to your American colleague. So you call him up, you say, man, I saw Mora Moro around Archimedes Seamount, and he starts laughing his ass off. He asks you whether you were on drugs during this dive, because no way that Mora Moro um, can be found ar around Archimedes Seamount, and you're definitely mistaken. So what was your crucial um, mistake here? Well, um, you did not go to marineregions.org because if you would have gone to marine regions, then you would have uh, seen that there's actually two Archimedes Seamounts. Um, uh, there's an Archimedes Seamount in the Mediterranean Sea and there's an Archimedes Seamount in the North Pacific Ocean. And so what is marine regions or how does uh, marine regions come into the story? Well, we try to improve um, access to and clarity of marine georeferenced place types, uh, uh, names and areas. Uh, and we do this by uh, giving each unique geo object a geo object or an MRG ID. So in this way, you can clearly see the difference between Archimedes Cement A and Archimedes Cement B. Uh, that's not the only thing we do. Um, we also provide you with the coordinates, of course, a latitude, longitude, a bounding box if that's available. Um, even if there's a WMS linked to this data, we can show this on a small map. Um, we're also going to give you a little bit of contextual information uh, through the place type. This will tell you, is this a sea mount? Is it a sandbank? Are you looking at something completely different? Uh, and of course, will give it a name. And now uh, two objects can have the same name, but of course one object can also have multiple names in multiple language. And we will also store all of this information in our database. And of course, we're also going to provide you with the source. Where did we get this information? Um, Marine Regions integrates a lot of other authoritative gazetteers, such as the JEPCO Gazetteer of Undersea Feature Names. Um, but we also have created some data sets our own, um, such as the maritime geo um, or the maritime maritime boundaries geo database containing um, uh, exclusive economic zones, territorial seas. So we have included all this information in the marine regions gazetteer as well. And then finally, a very important feature of our gazetteer that I have not talked about yet is the um, relations, because we have a hierarchy in our gazetteer with parents and children. So we're going to link uh, objects to their parents. And in this way, you can easily go through this hierarchy and, and learn about marine regions objects. Um, now, how can users access this data nowadays? So what is the current state? Uh, there are several ways to access this data. You can just go to our website, to the search page. Um, you can browse through the hierarchical browser, so through the parent-children relation. Um, for our most important data sets, we also have OGC web services, WFS, WMS, or we have REST services on our website. And then we also have a marine uh, regions R package, so M regions, um, if you want to check that out. So that's the current state. Um, but as we have heard already from, our, uh, from the people who were presenting before me, we can do more for our users. And our users include, among others, big uh, geographic uh, databases such as Worms or Eurobus or using marine regions. And so in order to go one step beyond what we have been doing so far, um, we are currently involved in a project 
with uh, the team of Pieter, uh, with Harm Delva, and also uh, with uh, the Vlis Open Science team of Mark Portier. Um, and so we try to open up this data even more, make it even less ambiguous um, by, um, yes, opening this data up as linked open data, basically. Um, this is a six month project. We are currently at the end of month number two. Um, and so um, what we have done until now is trying to link all our data to vocabularies to make sure that um, it's very clear what we are describing and what way we are describing and so that everybody um, and especially divers in the Mediterranean Sea can then clearly explain to their colleagues uh, where they found uh, their fish. Um, thank you very much for having me uh, and I hope this was clear for everyone. Thank you a lot, Brett, for the for the uh, very swift uh, presentation. And it's it's it's. Uh, I really like. I already forgot the name of the fish, but I really liked the the the, the example you you gave here. Uh, gave there, but I, I I feel it. I have a hard time to to identify with the, with the case that I would would uh, would be scuba diving in 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 in, uh, uh, in, in a warm Mediterranean uh, uh, atmosphere somewhere. Yeah, that that's something for uh, for post Corona. I think uh, to 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 look forward to. Um, uh, I, I find it really interesting. These three presentations, uh, like like the first presentation was about address registries, the the this uh, and 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 topological uh, topographical. Uh, help me out. Uh, top topographical, right? Uh, 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 registries. Uh, the the second one was about uh, about uh, cultural heritage, which is something completely different. And now the third presentation was again uh, about something completely different. And still, they're just a collection of objects that can be uh, be managed as a linked data event stream. And this becomes really interesting that we can start build to build uh, tools that just work. Uh, uh, across all these things at uh, at the same time. And speaking of a tool that can uh, work on top of these three different things uh, uh, and, and is, is generic in, in, in that sense, well, that's something that uh, Brecht is now going to present. Brecht? Thanks, Peter. Uh, should be loading. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, I am Brecht from IDLab Ghent, um, and I'm working on the Linked Data Events Team clients, the LDS client in short. Um, so what does this do? Um, this is, is being made in the, the Core Hand project. Um, like Olivier already said, we have a few Mozilla partners in Ghent that are publishing data. So these are like the data providers. And what you want is to build services on top of that. For example, Olivier wants to build a dashboard to see what the status is of the institutions, how many data they have published, and if their, their mappings are correct, etc. Or another service or application is, is the enrichment application. Uh, you want to add a link in the metadata from the object metadata uh, to the image itself or to uh, a presentation manifest following the IIIF specification that, that describes how the, the, the image should be displayed. Uh, another application would be a text search index in, so that users can easily find objects by, by typing in a search bar. Um, and of course, to do this, uh, you need to harvest data from these institutions to your application. And to do this, uh, I'm creating the Eldis client, uh, which is simply a harvester of linked data event streams, and so that you can copy the data into your database system. Now, you maybe have been wondering, don't we have OIE PMH, a difficult name to do that? Uh, which stands for the Open Archives Initiative, um, a protocol for metadata harvesting. So it, it sounds exactly like that. And indeed, it, it does a, a similar things. Uh, you have uh, a data provider with metadata and a repository. And on the other side, you have a service provider, which runs a client-side application called the Harvester also, that performs certain requests over the web and receives an XML encoded metadata 
about the things. And to do this, it has specific request types. And for example, a verb list records give me the records from after this time. Okay, we have this, but uh, what do we need now? Like this YPMH thing is invented in 2001. And yeah, linked data didn't exist at that time, actually. So it, it really needs uh, an update to, to be more um, performant. Um, for example, it, it returns, it works on XML. Nowadays, people don't work a lot in XML. It still exists a lot, but uh, we, have, we already have JSON now and we have linked data more coming up like JSON LD. So we need to go a step further there. Also, it uses hard-coded uh, requests. Uh, and now with with, uh, with like data event streams, you have a more hypermedia driven approach. And you, the, the client needs to follow relations to new documents, to new nodes. And these relations can be used spatially uh, or uh, in time based. Uh, so the, the client and the server becomes more loosely coupled and you can even use uh, indexes uh, to publish the data. Uh, also, OIEPMH is focused on the, retrieving the latest version of an object. Um, while with event streams, you can maintain all the versions uh, yourself and choose how, um, um, when you will drop older versions. For example, you will only maintain one year of data and after that, uh, people should have harvested already in their archive. So you can set some retention policies, how long you will uh, maintains certain versions. Uh, also for the server, uh, OIE works with the resumption token. This means that um, um, every client is like, like served uh, separately. Uh, with the token, um, the server needs to process this token and, and then give them the next uh, objects. While with event streams, you have cacheable fragments. Every document is the same. And this means that it becomes very lightweight for a server to host these. So all these things are, are, are ideas that have been evolved in the, in the last 20 years and are now applied in, the, in linked data specification. Uh, the eldest client is available on GitHub. You can find the link here. Uh, it's implemented with an actor-based architecture. And it's a new architecture, Communica, it's called, uh, that we've been developing in IDLab. Uh, it's a query engine um, uh, focusing on query over link, different linked data uh, sources. Um, and you can find the installation or the instructions here in the actor in it, this client package. And you can use it as a command line interface or as a JavaScript library. So let's now take an example. Uh, for the Cohen project, we have published data of Design Museum Kent in this link. Now I want to retrieve uh, all the data. What I can do is, for example, give a MIME type. I want to retrieve it in JSON-LD. Uh, this here is the context I want to apply it on. Uh, for example, it can be a translation in English. Um, and I'm, I want to only harvest after this time, after January the 1st this year, I want all the data from there on, and then the URL to your event stream. Now to see this live in action, I've run it here in my command line um, with these parameters. And now you see the, the, the objects on the event stream are like floating in. Uh, so I can process these uh, in my system and create my own services on top of it. So um, feel free to try it out in your command line, I would say. And if you have questions, I would like to hear it afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brecht. It's indeed uh, really nice to see the, the, the history from uh, OAI PMH uh, towards uh, uh, towards uh, linked data event streams and that we indeed do the same uh, have the same idea in mind but but that but that our solution is 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 more tailored towards http and linked data and and, and really brings it into the the uh, into 2021 instead of uh, the, the 2001 uh, version of the of the of the spec so uh, so uh, so really interesting work 
Um, uh, just maybe a side note that that it is uh, alpha version code. Eh? We, we we are sharing this code now for the first time at a uh, at a conference. So uh, uh, please open a lot of issues when you when you encounter uh, 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 encounter issues with it. Uh, I, I pasted the link in the in, in the chat to, towards the the, the link data event stream client. Um, uh, please forgive us if if something goes wrong. Uh, please open issues, and uh, we'll try to fix them as soon as possible, and give it uh, also a second chance if you're uh, uh, if, if you're able to do that. Um, with openness comes also a little bit uh, of uh, of uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, you cannot publish as uh, uh, early enough. But on the other hand, you only lose you you only have uh, one chance to make a first impression, and these two things need to be balanced. Well. I try to balance them by uh, by adding that uh, a side note here. So I like to release early, but uh, then please forgive us if there are still mistakes in it. Um, good. Uh, the next presentation is uh, by uh, Shors, who's uh, again from the uh, from the northern uh, neighbors. Um, Shors, can you hear us? Can you? Can, yeah, and there's my webcam. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, uh, feel free to take uh, control of the, of the presentation. Yes, and this is going to be hard, of course. Uh, the previous experiences, uh, in having the previous experiences in mind. Yeah, it, it appears to be an IQ test or something, but by yeah. which I don't mean that. That yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> I think there it is. Share. All right. The famous question: Can can you see my screen? <laughs> At this moment, we cannot. Ah, wait. Okay, it's yeah, loading. Now, yeah, now we can. Slow. All right. In a, in a few seconds. There it is. Yes, there it is. Perfect. Perfect. My name is uh, Sjorsten Valk. I'm involved in the Dutch Digital uh, Heritage Network, and I'm going to talk about um, autocompletion, which is a very specific use case for uh, using. Uh, or potentially using linked data event streams. So this is not a talk uh, on the perspective of a data publisher, but more of a data consumer. Uh, first off, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network is a partnership founded in 2015, um, a partnership of uh, Dutch cultural heritage institutions in the Netherlands, of course. And uh, our aim is to develop a system of national facilities and services for improving the visibility, the usability, and the sustainability of digital uh, heritage. And one of these uh, national facilities that we are working on is called the Network of Terms. And I'll explain this in a little bit. But first off, a little bit about cultural heritage. This is a painting, uh, a, a rather unknown painting. Uh, I have yet to meet the first person that knows who painted this painting. Um, it's called the Drawbridge in New Amsterdam. This is actually painted um, uh, near the place where I was born, uh, which explains my rather grim nature, probably. Um, uh, if I show the next painting, then you're, you'll probably know uh, who painted this one. Uh, this one is called uh, Almond Blossom, and uh, the creator of this painting, of course, is uh, Vincent van Gogh. Um, however, there, are, there is a problem. Uh, two institutions in this, uh, in this example own a painting of van Gogh on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. Both institutions use different terms to refer to the same information. In this case, they use different notations uh, to refer to Vincent van Gogh, for, for instance, written as V van Gogh or Vincent van Gogh. This, of course, is a problem for findability because people know that V van Gogh and Vincent van Gogh actually are the same person, but machines do not unless you tell them uh, so. Uh, so, uh, of course, we can encourage institutions to use the same terms to refer to the same information. For example, Vincent van Gogh. Easy, right? Uh, yes, but then there's another problem, the problem of identity, of course. Vincent van Gogh, as we know him, is the, this famous painter. But there's also another Vincent van Gogh 
his nephew, who has exactly, exactly the same name. So how can you distinguish between these two persons? Of course, uh, linked data uh, offers a solution. We can use identifiers, URIs, to refer to this one creator uh, of these paintings. These URIs stem from what we call terminology sources. And here are a bunch of them. And terminology sources is basically an umbrella term for, for Fisori classification systems, reference lists, authority files, uh, etc. Uh, there are uh, national terminology sources, but also international terminology sources. You may probably know a couple of these. So we want to encourage uh, cultural heritage institutions to start using terms from terminology sources. Uh, especially to start using URIs to refer to terms from terminology sources in order to improve the findability of their information. Um, but then new problems arise. Um, of course, user applications such as collection management systems can connect to the systems of these various terminology sources. But these systems use different API endpoints, for example, a Sparkle endpoint or some custom web API. And these terminology sources use different data models for exposing their information. And this makes it rather hard for user applications to connect to these sources because they have to understand the various API protocols and the various data models of these various terminology sources. And this hinders, of course, uh, the easiness with, uh, which, uh, for, for, for connecting to these sources. So we conceived a solution, and this solution is called the network of terms. Uh, this is an application uh, that is basically a gateway between user applications, such as collection management systems, and terminology sources. So user applications do not have to connect to the systems of terminology sources anymore. They can connect to the network of terms or to the API of the network of terms. So a user application can send a search query to the network of terms. The network of terms then repackages this query and sends it in real time to one or more terminology sources uh, in parallel. Uh, then collects the results of these uh, individual sources, uh, repackages them into one result set and returns this to the user application. And this one result set contains the matching terms, um, including, of course, the crucial URI uh, that a collection manager can then uh, store in his user application or in his collection management uh, system. Um, the network of terms offers a uniform API so that user applications do not have to know the specific API protocols and data models of the various uh, terminology sources. Uh, the API is working perfectly, but it's rather hard to uh, show this to collection managers or less technical people. So we also developed a so-called demonstrator. Uh, a rather simple visual interface that you can use for uh, uh, filling out some kind of search query, for example, Vincent van Gogh, uh, selecting one or more terminology sources. And when you hit the search button, then this demonstrator um, uh, calls our own API, uh, searches the sources and presents the results. This is also working perfectly, but there's one problem, one big problem. Users do not want to fill out uh, an entire search query. In this case, Vincent van Gogh. Users are lazy, collection managers are lazy. So they want to have a, some kind of Google-like experience that if they start typing, uh, then matching terms should pop up uh, instantly. In this case, Vincent van Gogh. Um, so how can we, um, add this feature, this functionality to our network of terms in a way that makes sense, that fits into our architecture. We could, of course, put into place some kind of auto-completion server. This server would then harvest data from all the terminology sources and stores this in some kind of index. Then user applications uh, would be able to query this auto-completion server. This, however, doesn't 
really fit into our uh, our architecture because it's not a decentralized uh, solution it's a centralized solution you would have to collect all the terms from all the terminology sources into one index it's not a really scalable solution because in this picture there are just three terminology sources but there are a lot more and this is uh, ever growing um, so our auto completion server would have to grow too and this is not a very lightweight solution. Our current network of terms implementation is lightweight because it directly queries the sources. Um, but this auto-completion server uh, would force us to maintain the data that we harvest and re-harvest it periodic periodically in order to uh, uh, keep the information current. Luckily, we stumbled upon something called tree. And of course, this has been explained before. Uh, and three offers a solution for our auto-completion uh, problem. So we teamed up with IDLab, with Peter and, uh, and Harm Delva, uh, and asked them to develop a prototype for us that demonstrates uh, uh, the uh, auto-completion functionality for us using the tree vocabulary. And what it basically looks like, looks like is that there is a terminology source. This terminology source publishes its terms, its data, as RDF. This is rather common, so this is not really new. This is something that uh, most terminology sources in our network already do. Uh, this data gives us the opportunity to uh, 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 introduce a new component, the so-called fragmenter. This fragmenter uh, grabs the data, uh, and creates lots of tiny fragments of the original data file, of the original RDF data file. Uh, and for autocompletion, this basically means that a fragment, uh, for instance, in the case of Vincent van Gogh, consists of the V of van Gogh. This V has a relation with the A, V, A, N, etc. So you can build up an, an entire tree of relationships between characters of terms. So in the end, uh, all terms, all the parts of terms have their own fragments, uh, have their own fragment. And this fragment basically is just an RDF file, a very small RDF file, but an RDF file nonetheless. Then there's some fragments server because all these tiny fragments uh, in itself do not do anything. You need a server to make these fragments accessible. A fragment server. So uh, interestingly, uh, the data, uh, the, 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 the source data must be provided by the source. If you cannot do this, um, uh, then you're not a really good data publisher, right? <laughs> um, you can, of course, uh, uh, provide some kind of RDF dump. However, uh, and this is, of course, the interesting, interesting part, you could also offer your data as some kind of linked data event stream. So that becomes a continuous stream, which would then fit into, into a pipeline where as soon as updates arrive from a terminology source, for instance, a new term, term has been added, uh, the fragmenter could uh, recreate uh, or create a fragment of the new term and then make it accessible for the fragments server to serve it to whoever is interested in these fragments. The other components, the fragmenter and the fragment server, however, can either be provided by the terminology source, if the source has the resources for um, maintaining this kind of infrastructure, or a service provider can do this. And this fits rather well into the uh, picture that Peter painted uh, at the beginning. Um, this is the tier approach. Uh, there's something that you must do yourself as data publisher, and, and there are things that you can do, but also things that other people or other parties can, can do for you. This, uh, uh, this is all uh, good, but uh, there's still no auto-completion functionality, right? We have a bunch of fragments uh, and a fragment server, but that's it. So there's, we, we need more than this. Uh, so the fragment server. The fragment server are very, very simple servers. They just serve plain RDF files. Uh, to offer this auto-completion functionality, we need an auto-completion client. And this is a smart client. It knows how to request fragments from one or more fragment servers. It knows how to interpret the data inside these fragments. Uh, and it knows uh, something about auto-completion, for instance, uh, about ordering the results, ordering the terms in some kind of 
a fashion that makes sense for auto completion. Um, interestingly, uh, 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 tapping into what uh, Brecht already mentioned, uh, this auto completion client too has been developed using the Communica framework. Um, so our auto completion client is not a, just a simple client. It's, it's basically a small uh, a query engine uh, that understands uh, the vocabulary that we use for making auto completion work. Uh, at the end, there's of course a user application, or as Peter mentioned this in his talk, an awesome application. This is the part where the user interface uh, resides. This is where end users. For instance, collection managers of cultural heritage institutions uh, work. Um, and this is where they uh, fill out their search query, where the autocompletion func functionality uh, starts to kick in. And the user application operates the autocompletion client, which then queries uh, the fragment server or servers. And there we have it, autocompletion functionality. But what does it look like in practice? We also asked IDLab to not only develop a prototype for the fragments, fragmenter and the fragment server, but also a demonstrator, uh, a visual interface, uh, in order to show the results so that it actually works. And uh, this is it. You can go to this URI and try some, uh, some terms yourself. The, this demonstrator currently searches four sources, four quite different sources, for instance, the cultural heritage resource and the uh, Second World War, a uh, World War II thesaurus. Uh, so and this is my query, uh, FIR, and it's, uh, it results in uh, uh, terms like fur, first, fires, firewalls, uh, etc. Uh, is there something special about this demonstrator? No, this is, this is exactly the functionality that you would expect of an autocompletion function, right? A search bar and autocompleted results. Um, so, uh, from an end user's perspective, this is precisely what we want. Uh, however, underneath it all, there's this fragmenter. There are these fragments. There's the tree specification. There's a linked data event stream, hopefully, eventually in place, for making this work. And this fits perfectly into our architecture of having this decentralized approach with linked data as the core method for uh, publishing and using data. So what's next? Uh, this is a prototype. Uh, so uh, we need to test it thoroughly. Uh, for instance, we want to measure performance, especially user perceived performance. Is it good enough for users uh, to use? And another perspective is, uh, what is the exact quality of the autocompleted uh, terms? So we need to look at the contents of the, of the terms that are uh, found. If this is all successful, then we would like to bring it into production. Uh, we don't know yet when, but probably uh, uh, thinking of Air Erwin here uh, on April the, the 1st, uh, we, we have to wait, wait and see. <laughs> um, that's it. Thank you very, very much. Uh, if you would like to know more about this auto completion functionality, please, uh, uh, please contact us, uh, tech at netwerkdigitalairgood.nl. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Josh. So um, we've now seen uh, three data sets being presented, an address registry um, uh, to the, the, the uh, cultural heritage data set, the Marine Regions Gazetteer. We've seen two clients being presented, one just taking a copy of the entire uh, linked data event stream. And uh, the second client was uh, auto-completion across, uh, across a fragmentation. I've put all the links that you that you need to to recreate that for your own data sets. I put them all in the chat. So the uh, all the tools that we create as should be at an open Belgium event, of course, are open source and all the data sets are open data. So please uh, try to get your hands dirty. We're I'm an academic, so so I'm afraid that sometimes uh, what I say is a little bit too early for 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 market adoption sometimes, but it's I promise you that's pretty close to market adoption. So, so if you want to be one step ahead, start playing with, uh, with these, uh, these tools. Um, the next presentation is again, um, uh, another data sets uh, use case. So now we've, we've mainly talked about uh, base registries. 
um, or, or or data sets that really need to be reused as they are the reference for 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 many other data sets. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Olivier also already mentioned ah well time series we we should man we should try to to also find an overlap with time series. I think that this is exactly what uh, Philip Michels from IMAC is going to uh, to hint towards, right, uh, Philip? Uh, you're on mute. That's another one for the bingo. Yeah. <laughs> See if I can pass uh, IQ test. You know, if you see something, it uh, it is loading. So uh, I think yes, you passed the IQ test. Congrats! Ah, great. <laughs> Floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, my name is uh, Philippe Michiels, and um, yeah, I'm I'm working for uh, IMEC, uh, um, but uh, uh, we're working together on digital twins, also with uh, with Flanders, with uh, uh, information agency in Flanders, um, and um, yeah, I wanted to. Um, explain in this presentation uh, uh, how we see linked data events uh, streams supporting uh, digital tweets. Um, so um, for those of you who don't really know what digital twins are, uh, they're basically decision support systems for city planners and policy makers. That's how, how, how we look at them. Yeah? So um, it, it's more than just uh, yeah, the fancy visualizations that you typically see in, the, in the, these demos, of course. Uh, the idea is that we are trying to uh, understand the dynamics of, of cities uh, by merging data streams and by applying models uh, to those data streams <clears throat> um, for performing simulations. Right? Good example is uh, if we want to implements circulation plans in cities, then we want to maybe um, um, simulate the effects of several different uh, circulation plans, see what the effects are, and then choose the ones, uh, the one that fits uh, best our criteria. Um, the thing with, with uh, digital twins and, and these computational models that are running behind it is that they're quite data hungry machines. Um, and um, what we want to do basically is correlate and process data from, from different sources and uh, of different nature. So uh, Peter was hinting towards it. It can be sensor data um, for the large part, of course, sensor data is very important uh, for us, but also it can also be other data. For instance, um, um, I will show a case where, where demographic data can, be, can play a role as well. Um, and you want to correlate all of this so you will need something else as well. So what's the concept of um, what we are doing in the Duet project, uh, which is a European digital twin project? The idea there is that we um, uh, try to um, uh, see data sources, models, and visualizations as components that can be fitted generically to a central data broker. That's, that's the concept that we are trying to, to look at. And now, of course, it's all very nice, but if you want to connect these data sources and, and they're all in different uh, formats and they're all they, they don't have uh, uh, clear semantics or they're not the semantics are not well defined and that's uh, easily going to bring us into problems it's going to be an integration nightmare and it's going to be very costly to adapt these data sources to make sure that they work with our models um, um, and and what we want to do is to connect any data source with any model so it's a bit difficult then so uh, yeah, back to the fancy demos. The fancy demos of digital twins is what you see. It's the iceberg at the top, uh, but below that is a whole lot of things going on. And, and a big part of that is actually getting data to be interoperable, uh, to break the silos that are typically found in these data sources, to uh, address the issues of data quality uh, and do things like data anonymization. So that's um, our biggest problem, and, and we kind of figured that out. Uh, one day, uh, we had a very good ID, uh, and we naively tried to solve the uh, issue of figuring out what is the quality of life in a certain uh, part of the city. Uh, so street by street, we wanted to assess the quality of life in the city, um, and we had um, kind of an equation that would take into account uh, different aspects of the city. So this could be... Um, 
are there shops nearby? Uh, is there public transportation in your neighborhood? So how busy is the street you are living in? Um, are there parks, et cetera, et cetera? So very, very diverse um, data sources. And um, yeah, most of these data sources were available somehow in some form, but usually they were not really, um, um, yeah, semantically well defined so they were not published as openly in data so and we quickly found out that it was way too hard to try and uh, manually hook up every part uh, of every data set uh, to each other so it was almost impossible and this, this was really typical for a lot of uh, use cases that we tried to uh, implement using digital twins so um with duet we have the we have the, the intent to create uh, a digital twin platform for Flanders. Um, so um, the idea is then, okay, uh, where is the data in Flanders? And um, there's quite a lot of data. Um, so there's the authentic, uh, authentic data sources eh, which are being uh, hosted by, by the Flanders Information Agency. But there's also uh, uh, tons of other data sources um, uh, spread across so many different organizations. They're countless. Um, but most of these data sets, unfortunately, um, are not published, eh? so they're not accessible. But even if they are accessible, they're not always interoperable. Eh? So that's the that's the main issue we face. Um, and um, uh, one by one onboarding just does not scale; it's too expensive. Um, so um, we're, we were kind of yeah um, disillusioned, you could say, uh, because um, yeah. How how do we go about this? I mean, there's there's lots and lots of data, but it's it's really way too hard to just onboard it and use the digital twins. So um, we saw earlier today that and th this is really giving us hope, uh, or giving me hope, and uh, I was really enthusiastic to see this. Um, that that it's actually very easy to implement the uh, linked data event stream standard, and so um, I think uh, linked data event streams can help in many ways. Um, first of all, um, they can remove obstacles that we are typically facing when we try to publish open data. And we have seen that it's very easy to implement. Um, and it's also a strategy where we can separate publication from the actual management of the data, which I think makes it much more feasible to, to, to achieve. Um, the, the requirements are fairly limited. Um, they're well written and they're easy to implement. Um, what's also helping is that it's a more robust approach to uh, to building time series um, uh, around sensor data. Typically today, the, the approach of uh, keeping time series of, on sensor data is to, to subscribe to uh, the sensor event stream. Um, but the problem there is that uh, you need to specify what kind of data you want to historically keep. And with linked data event streams, if we just onboard everything as linked data event streams, not only the sensor data, but also the context, then we have a robust way of keeping everything, the history of everything, which is essential in digital twins, and make sure that we can time travel, not only in the values of the sensors, but also in the context of the sensors, and also the context of the digital twin itself. Because if you are uh, doing uh, evidence-based policies, uh, and you want to validate the results of a simulation, you want to be able to go back in time, not only in terms of the results, but also in terms of the surrounding conditions. If uh, if you're doing an experiment of uh, an a circulation plan in a city, but you don't have this, the, the, the situation of the actual streets of that time, at the time you were running the simulation, then you cannot recreate the experiment and the results are not worth much. Um, so uh, another uh, good thing is that we can have these uh, reusable building blocks uh, where we can do things like reconciliation, which is essential. And we want to be able to link uh, elements of, the, of one data stream uh, to elements in another one. So being able to um, uh, have a uniform system of referring uh, to, to records and also linking to other sources is, is essential to us. Uh, and also, of course, having the possibility to create derived data streams um, where we can have, uh, where, where we can subscribe onto the raw data stream, apply calibration models, do aggregations, apply anonymization, uh, which all, are all essential tools for us in, uh, in building digital twins. 
And a good example of such a building block is address match, which is actually an existing service of the, of the Flemish uh, government, where they, um, based on addresses uh, and, and the way they are uh, entered into a system, try to resolve that to an actual address rec record, which is very similar to the demo that we just, uh, we just happened to see for uh, when we were looking for Vincent van Gogh in all of its possible writings. Um, and what we want to achieve basically is to not just have data sources, but eventually to have all linked data sources. Uh, and if all of these um, data sources can be published as linked data event streams, then uh, that's going to speed us up considerably. So I'm, I'm very hopeful and also very thankful uh, for everyone that is doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, it's it's one one thing I particularly um, liked in your presentation is the fact that you that you said like ah, but it, it's really important in order, uh, even even uh, if you want to prove something later on uh, uh, towards your government, if you if you got a certain certificate uh, saying ah, because of uh, uh, because of that street and and uh, and this. Um, uh, uh just thinking and this artwork that it that, that at that moment was at the museum uh that's why you get a certificate that you actually visited that 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 artwork and that in that street and so on just trying to combine different data sets here that then still you also want to rewind your data set or you want to go back in time and make sure that you can still uh still prove that that certificate is, uh, is, is correct uh, or or it was correct at, at, at that time. So yeah. that's indeed uh, it's, another... Uh, it's called, it's called uh, data traveling capabilities, uh, uh, time traveling, uh, data time traveling capabilities, I'm sorry. Um, and, and it's considered essential in uh, also in big data processing, by the way. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, and certainly if you have digital twins where you have then forecasting models and then, then based on 100 data sets, then you do a certain forecasting. And then if later someone comes to you and say, ah, oh, but why did you do that in hindsight? Uh, look look what happened. We could have uh, predicted this. Then you can say, ah, oh, could we? Okay, let's let's go back and let's... Uh, uh, let's that's uh, also, let's that's also the nice, uh, very nice aspect on Eldest, I think, because it includes uh, archiving um or uh, archiving specifications so you can be specific about uh, what your intent is in terms of retention of data and that kind of stuff it's really important yeah, yeah. okay great so uh let's move to the last uh, uh, presentation and then there's some room for uh, questions uh, uh, i hope it's uh, uh Annelies de Krane. are you are you with us we had some technical difficulties at the in the in the beginning. I hope we were we were able to resolve these by now. I hope. Um, hi, I'm already. Hi, we can hear yeah, you. That's already a good thing. Yeah, I had some difficulties, but that's uh, solved right now. Um, I should be able to share my camera and share my screen. So no webcam for me, but uh, I'm on the laptop of my daughter. So I think we blocked that <laughs> earlier. Um, try to share my screen. Otherwise, Peter, maybe you can share your screen and uh, we can switch to that then. Yes. Um. Um. I'll give it one more try. Now I, of course, need to be able to open a, a PowerPoint presentation. God. Um... Yeah, I'm on a computer that's not mine, so that's a problem. Peter, if you want, I can show the presentation. Uh, okay, yes, that would, uh, that would help me, yes. Okay. OK. 
Okay. I also have it ready, uh, Astrid. Uh, do you want me to do it instead? Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just try to do it. Uh, it was it was loading. It said. Ah, okay. I think I now share my screen. Yeah, yeah. Well. Okay, okay. Perfect. Okay. Yes, thank you. So I will just uh, shout when we switch. Uh, Perfect. Slides. Yes. Thank you so much for this collaboration. Uh, so thank you, Peter, and uh, all the colleagues uh, to have us here eh? as um, Informatie Vlaanderen and now Digital uh, Digital Vlaanderen. So maybe Digital Flanders is the new name. Um, what I really want to share with you today is the experience we the experiences we had and the capacity, capacity building we did at Digital Vlaanderen. So I won't go into technical details, but I'll give you a short uh, tour around in our learning curve about uh, linked data event streams. And then you will also see the link with uh, uh, the Digital Twin project and um, the items Philippe already mentioned in his, uh, in his slide. So you can move on to the next slide, please. Yes, so maybe um, I just wanted to um, to pose this because Digital Vlaanderen is just uh, the new name um, very recently of uh, Agentschap Informatie Vlaanderen or Flanders Information Agency for the international community. So it's actually the same uh, company with uh, some more IT uh, departments now involved and it's now called Digital Vlaanderen. But we're actually the same people. Um, Okay, next, thank you. So within uh, Digital Vlaanderen, we have um, different uh, programs uh, who are um, working on uh, the digitization of the Flemish government and its stakeholders. Uh, and within Digital Vlaanderen, we also have uh, a program where I'm working for, and it's the program Authoritative Data Sources of Digital Vlaanderen. And uh, within this program, we have uh, some experiences about linked data event streams and insights. And that's what I really would like to share with you today. So we have one uh, aspect on uh, the smart data track. Uh, then um, linked data event streams for the building registry and the address registry. Um, a really uh, short um, thing about Oslo and the linked data event streams for the large scale reference database, also called HRB or Basiskaart Vlaanderen for the Dutch speaking people. So, first of all, I want to zoom out a little bit um, from open data to smart open data. So, um, we started a track, I think, one year and a half ago. Um, about smart data and uh, to zoom a little bit out on how we can uh, open up our scope and um, with an, an open mind and open innovative thought, how we can um, manage all the data and the data streams that are coming ahead of us. So we have now, uh, certainly in the smart city landscape, but also in governments and the evidence-based policy uh, track uh, everybody's going into, that data becomes still more and more a foundation for designing the society and the future of the citizens and, and policymakers of tomorrow. That's also the, the link to what Philippe just told. And we have multiple data sources. We have the slow moving data as we know it, and that's the data from the, like for example, the base registries and the authoritative data sources. And we also have more new, um, data streams like the fast moving data from sensors or real time um, updates we need from different data sources. And the, those, uh, are, those things are very challenging, yeah? those huge amounts of data. How can we cross those data um, on the different domains? How can we link all those data with their context? How can we make data more reusable? in that context and how do we deal with scalability and the ones only principle and all that kind of um, challenges can you skip uh, yes so that's why we what we call them the smart data trajectory and we really want to focus on the findability accessibility interoperability reusability and the ease of use of data and for that um, linked data is for us uh, key so what we understand in, in smart data is actually that it can make the connections 
between the different data sets. And if you then consider a smart uh, region, a smart uh, city or something like that, you need to be able to connect the objects in the field, like a road, uh, a building, an address, uh, with uh, potential fast-moving data sources like sensors. And the smoother the link is going, the more information you can distract from it. And um, this can help or enable to provide uh, solutions in the field of mobility, healthcare, environment. So that's the zoom out I wanted to make. And to have all this, the qualitative uh, data, uh, authoritative data sources are really fundamental to have it on, um, to have these data available to link all this to. Okay. And so in our learning curve, step one is um, we started uh, last summer a prototyping phase on linked data, event streams, and linked data fragments. Um, and then you can, uh, yes. And uh, to make uh, the story complete, it was uh, together with uh, the team of uh, IMAC IT Lab, but also some um, uh, enthusiastic students from Open Summer of Code, and of course, our information, uh, Flanders Information Agency, or Informatie Vlaanderen. We started a prototype uh, on linked data event streams. And if you now click uh, Astrid, thank you. No, it's uh, I'm I'm showing it. Uh, ah, uh, oh, sorry. Peter. Yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, but I also wanted to make make uh, make clear to the to the, to the um, uh, community at at Open Knowledge Belgium that we also did it at Open Summer of Code. So so uh, so we also so so the foundations of linked data event streams really also come from within uh, within Open Knowledge Belgium itself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, prototyping with linked data event streams for fast and slow moving data. So the the <clears throat> the first hurt we hurdle we wanted to take was of course um, how can we uh, manage uh, sensor data so fast moving data and um, are we able to to publish it in a in a sustainable way and, and what's the the knowledge we need for that. Um, and how do we relate it with the slow moving data sets? And so there was um, kind of a capacity, build, capacity building uh, needed. Um, and then we started with, um, with a prototype with the team of Peter on linked data event streams. It also gave us um, some really uh, interesting insights on the architectural part. Um, you will see it later on in the presentation. It really is the blueprint for uh, something big we're doing today. Uh, and it also gives uh, really uh, valuable insights on scalability, load, the possibilities on the query side, uh, so for reusers, et cetera. Um, next uh, slide. So what we, um, at least what, what I uh, found really uh, valuable and, and learned from the prototype was that we could publish um, a fast moving data set and a slow moving data set. So sensor data on which we were very um, or yeah, quite immature, uh, and also our base registry, the address registry, as linked data event stream. So, and it was quite a similar way. We didn't have to do anything exotic. It could fit for both types of data sets. And um, some uh, really interesting insights on the linked data fragments, uh, where you can have uh, your query module and um, question it, question efficiently. Uh, through different data sources. That was really um, uh, interesting for me. And then the second um, step um, was actually uh, the opportunity we had to um, step into the CEMIC project with uh, Peter, his team, um, to make um, a few of our authoritative data sources into linked data event streams. And you can see them already up front um, in the above. So uh, we have the building registry slash address registry, large scale reference database, and uh, it's all based, of course, on the semantic interoperability model of Oslo. So it's really a quick overview. Um, for the building registry and address registry, the, we already work with uh, event streams, but um, in this um, semic pilot, uh, we move, oh, okay, thank you. We Sorry moved about that. linked data event streams. So um, the ongoing work right now, uh, I'm not going to step into detail, is that actually uh, the linked data event stream is um, 
is ready to be published and it's now in a test phase uh, as a projection on top of the raw uh, data set. And what's the, uh, what is the link pointing to? Ah, well, that was ah, that should be an error. The, the that's that's not a link. Ah, uh, yeah, it's the yeah, okay, it's the Flemish URI standard. Okay, but I'll, I will put a, a link to the to the pull request that Dwight prepared uh, yeah. in, the, in the in the chat. <laughs> Maybe a copy paste stuff. Okay, and key in this um, in this realization of linked data event streams is uh, for us um, uh, with our colleagues of uh, Oslo Open Standards for Linked Organizations is the semantic uh, interoperability model, and so the vocabularies and the application profiles and I, the URL is also on the on the web page. Uh, it's key to achieve a linked data event stream uh, for our data sources. We can switch to the next one. And the standards being used for the realization of this one are uh, Adressenregister, uh, I'm sorry for that, but it's in, uh, in Dutch, and Gebouwenregister. So, um, also available on datavlaanderen.be. Move to the next, uh, Peter. Okay. And then we have the large scale reference database, also called uh, GRB or Basiskaart Vlaanderen. Uh, which is a large-scale topographic map uh, containing um, lots of information about uh, buildings, parcels, roads, uh, whatsoever. And uh, today, uh, this is available as a VFS and is also um, uh, dumpable as a uh, by download downloading your dataset. And there, uh, our colleague is still working on. Um, and then you can move to the next slide. This is. Um, in the phase where um, we need to run now an Oslo standardization uh, project to make it uh, fit, and then um, we can move on with linked data event stream implementation. So that's quite uh, brief about this one. And then um, step three, it's um, even, um, it's always a little bit bigger. Um, and step three is actually that the linked data event streams and um, the concept about it is really at the core of our new architecture that we are now going to um, further, um, uh, how do you say it, propose to the policy makers in uh, Belgium uh, in our Relance project. So Relance is, uh, is uh, a really big thing in, in Flanders and um, so we are now preparing, um, how do you call it in English, a nota for the Flemish government in which we present our architecture uh, and all our um, <laughs> all our goals for this Relance project. Um, and really in the core of this, we also use linked data event streams in our uh, technical solution. So this is actually um, a zoom out of the Relance uh, project we are now working on, Sensor Data Platform. And um, what you see here is actually um, four silos or four um, key components of this uh, trajectory. Um, and why are we doing this? That's maybe the first question to answer. Uh, Annalise, you're muted all of a sudden. Can you unmute? Ah, and uh, she's yeah. gone. Yes, no, I'm, I'm ah. back. Okay, great. <laughs> it was done automatically. But uh, as I was saying, because I'm really enthusiastic about uh, the Relance uh, project and the sensor data platform we are going to uh, pitch there, is that um, we really want to uh, enable data publishing and data reuse uh, for a more um, uh, and brighter and, uh, and bigger uh, data flow of all kinds of data and sp specifically sensor data. And what we, do, so we, re what we try to do is uh, bridging um, the gap for the data suppliers and the data sources and also sensor data sources to unlock them from their maybe silo they are in and uh, by all, by, um, moving it into the architecture we are uh, proposing here with uh, um, open source building blocks, we want to enable this data to flow and to be uh, much more easier to reuse by uh, other partners, by new uh, business models 
that kind of thing. So the relance um, block you see in the middle consists of all kinds of uh, open source components. We sometimes also call it a publication street of components with uh, in the core linked data event streams, uh, with which um, all those data suppliers can more easily uh, maybe publish as linked data uh, their data and unlock it from or the domain or the supplier or the location where they uh, originated from. And that's the first part. And then, um, but that's maybe not this relevant here in this um, uh, meeting. Uh, we really focus on standards for all this. Um, we want to have an ecosystem that works with it and a governance on it. And so this is just um, an image of our functional architecture in a more um, detailed way. But uh, what I really wanted to show you was that linked data event streams is really in the core of our solution. It is a draft, but um, I think it's a, a beautiful way forward to uh, unlock the data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Annalise. Um, I, I would like to ask all, all speakers that 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 uh, that have spoken uh, to to share their webcam again, but uh, so that so that uh, we can be visible again to the to the audience. And um, yeah, well, I, I think that the really nice thing about about your presentation, Annalise, is is, is that is to to, to show that uh, that this was really the the beginning of of linked data event streams in in, in last summer uh, during during summer of code, but that it evolved and that we got more and more people on board uh, uh, while doing that, and that now it's really at the core of of, uh, of what we want to do uh, regarding uh, data management at the the the, the, the Flemish government. Um, uh, which, which of, of course will 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 translate uh, in, into into multiple tools, generic tooling that uh, that 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 will be uh, created. But uh, uh, not to be underestimated is that you also said that there are going to be two linked data event streams that we're going to start with. One, the address registry in Flanders, and to do the the GRB in Flanders, Flanders the GRB, the uh, grootschalige referentiebestand, which is the uh, which is exactly the um, BGT in the Netherlands, and the address registry or the address and building registry in the Netherlands is also going to be to to do it, and also the address registry in in Flanders. So this will cater for some really interesting cross uh, cross member state uh, uh, use cases. Um, and and I'm really looking forward to 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 seeing how like two completely different backends, but with the same data, but with different slightly different data models, because the Netherlands has has their own data models and and Flanders have their own uh, data models that we can can still then later on align them and make sure that we can seamless uh, seamlessly uh, uh, query over the, the 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 two data sets in parallel. At least that if we can give a demo like that, that would be great. And if then at the same time we can, for free, give a demo where we can also query over marine regions gazetteer, over the the, the five uh, collections in uh, from the Musea in Ghent, over uh, digital twin models, over uh, 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 what else did we talk about? I I almost already forgot, um, but. Um, uh, all these different data sets, I think they will they will uh, they will become uh, queryable uh, to the masses this way, and we will have an automatic ecosystem. When 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 people set up a new intermediate uh, index, it will be added to the ecosystem. If they put it put it uh, put it down, it will also ah uh, okay it, it disappeared, but still the, the the ecosystem will be able to recover by just uh, uh, fetching the right uh, uh, data just in time. We have about two minutes left for uh, uh, questions. Luckily, I don't see too many questions uh, popping up in the chat. But if there would be any questions, it is no or never. And I will only take one question, which was not according to us to, to, to plan. But still, I think we had an interesting session. Any questions in the chat? Three, two, one. Ah, I see. Sure, stifling. Sure, feel free to, to immediately uh, take the take the floor. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Yeah, I've, I have one question. Um, uh, how do you publish your data set information if you use linked data event streams? For instance, how does this uh, LDS fit into the DCAT uh, model? 
Uh, for um, instance, er Erwin told something about slash feed for publishing your event streams. But uh, how can we discover your event streams? Uh, uh, yes, th this is also part of the of the three CG specification. So you can also just go to the specification and read about DCAT compatibility, where where, where that that's mentioned. But indeed, I, I I do see that 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 these collections are going to be added as distributions of data sets. So uh, the, the the DCAT model is is a is a is a, a catalog uh, the uh, data sets and distribution. I think the data set is like the address registry, and then the 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 feed is your specific distribution of how to retrieve the uh, the data set but but also adding the the, the metadata about the specific collection and about, and the views that are created on, on on top of that you will be able to have even richer uh, metadata in which you can use your dcat catalog to say like oh i just want all the uh, collections or all the distributions that for example have a uh, use the property sosa result time and for me, SOSA result time that would indicate that I have a time series, so I can 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 uh, can can use that in the tree specification. Just as uh, Geraldine also posted in the in, in the chat, we also indeed uh, uh, point to DC terms conforms to to indicate that you uh, conform that you conform to the the tree specification, so that in that way you can also immediately find all the data sets that uh, that uh, use this way of uh, publishing your data. Okay, thank you. Good, and this was immediately a question for me. So, 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 thank you very much. It's six o'clock. My uh, my kid is screaming downstairs for for my attention. So, I will also not take more of your uh, uh, time uh, this way. But uh, I want to wrap up by saying that the presentations, uh, please, dear speakers, uh, send them to me if I don't already have them. I will make sure that they're uh, posted online so that it can be used by uh, the uh, uh, by the audience to to, uh, uh, to 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 read up on it and to click the links in in in, in uh, your uh, uh, presentations. Um, the video itself will also be shared on the Open Belgium uh, website. If you uh, in the audience want to uh, uh, start uh, get your hands dirty with linked data event streams, ping me or go to the GitHub repository or send send us uh, send us an email or just immediately go to the specs. Get your hands dirty. We will be more than happy to 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 help you out if you bump uh, against uh, against anything. And last but not least, I would like to um, uh, but not maybe penultimate uh, uh, but not uh, but not least uh, I, I will uh, thank my speakers uh, uh, Brecht Brit Annelies Philippe Olivier Erwin uh, Wouter who already left and and, and George thank you very much for being part of this uh, uh, thanks for for making uh, making linked data event streams credible because uh, because thanks to your implementations and thanks to your uh, projects using it in the, in the real world it, it is becoming a reality not because there's some vague specification uh, about it um, so thank you very much and for your uh, enthusiastic uh, presentations and uh, last but not least i would like to thank of course the people from cloud 86 who have been uh, uh, great at uh, at providing us with uh, support uh, uh, when when things didn't always technically work out so with these final words um, thank you everyone uh, and uh, See you, uh, see you online in in, in the, your next question about linked data event streams. Bye. <laughs>